Hey guys, how you doing this morning? Good, man. It's good to be here. It's always good to get to uh, come back home for just a little bit. I'm a Maryland boy, uh, born and raised. And then in 2014, my wife and I, we moved out to uh, Cleveland, Ohio to help uh, start a church campus out there. And so uh, excited to get to come back, get to see some friends and family, uh, as well as to get to, to hang out with, uh, with Michael and uh, some of the guys I uh, graduated school with. And so it's, uh, so it's good to be here. Uh, so as I was talking with Michael about kind of what we were going to be talking talking about this morning, I realized really uh, the best way to kind of set up what it is we're going to be, be looking at out of the, the, the Bible today is, is, to, is by acknowledging, you know, when it comes to winning, there's really two different kinds of people. And, and, and I think really the best way to illustrate this, you know, quickly is by using uh, our football teams. You know, when it comes to winning, uh, there's, you have like uh, the Baltimore Ravens, right? Ain't Baltimore Ravens fan? Yeah, there you go. Um, and then you have the Cleveland Browns, right? I mean, there's, 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 there's a drastic difference between those two organizations uh, right there. And so really what I, I mean by setting it up that way is when it comes to winning, there, there's two types of people. There's the in, in it to win it's people, that would be your Ravens, and then there's the like, take it or leave it's people, you know, which would be the Browns, you know, people who would say, you know, like, I, I'm not really that competitive, uh, I, maybe you have said things like, I'm just here to have fun. You know, maybe you even, if you're, if you're, a, take it, uh, if you're a take it or leave it person, you would maybe even say, like, I avoid games because uh, it draws a line that I'm uncomfortable with or, you know, that I just don't really, really care about. Like, winning's cool, uh, but, you know, I'm not worried if I don't. I could take it or I could leave it. But you're, if you're an in it to win it person, Everything I just said makes you angry, right? That's that you're like you're in it to win it, people. Like winning is everything. Like you'll do whatever it takes. Uh, uh, I think a really good example of this is there's a leader at Momentum, the church I help lead in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, there's a leader. His name is Vern Blaze. Like that's yes, that's actually his 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 legal name. Which I don't know that there's a better last name for a guy than than Blaze, uh, and then it, it becomes even a better last name for him when you discover that he loves to run, and he coaches middle school and high school cross country, you know, so Vern Blaze, so you got a guy that loves to run, last name Blaze, it's like, of course, that would be his, his last name. Well, he was telling me just a couple of months ago that before they were getting ready to have practice in the fall, it was like October, and it was a pretty nice day out. It hadn't yet turned gray, and it hadn't snowed in Cleveland yet, and so he was uh, really excited to do something different than their normal warm-up as the cross-country team. He thought he would do something to build some camaraderie and stuff, and so he decided that he was going to divide the boys up, and they were going to play ultimate Frisbee. And when he divided up the teams, he realized he had an odd number of guys there that day. And so he's like, well, that's no problem. Like, I'll just play. But as he's telling me the story after church one day, he, he, he tells me, he says, like, but here's the deal, Curtis. Like, if I'm going to play, I play to win. And so he starts playing. Here's that Vern, a 57-year-old man out there just giving it all he's got to win this ultimate Frisbee game. And he's telling me the story. And he said, Curtis, it's coming down to the last point. And, and, and I go to the end zone. And someone throws the Frisbee. And he goes, and, and there, he's surrounded. He's flanked by two middle school boys. And he said, Curtis, I was in it to win it, but my calf muscle wasn't. He said I, he jumped to grab the frisbee, and when he jumped, he tore his calf muscle. And, he's t and it, all this started because he's like limping around on Sunday morning. I'm like, oh, dude, Vern, man, that's, that's terrible, dude. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, what happened? What did you do? How did things like play out? And he looked right back at me as I was like the biggest idiot on the planet. And he looked me dead in the eye, and he said, Curtis, my team won. What do you think happened? So here's kind of a, like a quick test to discover like which one of those two people you are. If you hear Vern's story and you're like, that's ridiculous. Why would anyone ever do something like that or be proud of that? You're probably a take it or leave it person when it comes to winning. 
Because if you're an in it to win it person, you're like, good for him. He should have. If he's going to be out there, at least he would win, you know. That's, that's your in it to win it's people. And if I'm honest with you, uh, I am definitely a more of an in it to win it person. Uh, we played, uh, Michael and I, I have told you stories about the college we went to in Johnson T- City, Tennessee, um, it was a small campus. We had about 1,000 students that were part of, of Milligan, and uh, we played a water tag assassin game where you were, had like one person you were supposed to take out, and it was supposed to get down to the last person, and it just so happened that Michael and I were two of the last three people that were left in this game, and I got tricked by the guy who had me, and he tagged me, and I got out. Well, I, I wasn't going to stand for that, and so I thought real quick, I chased him down the hallway, I tackled him and sat on him and yelled in the hallway until Michael could come out and tag him and get him out and we could still win and split the, split the prize. Like, uh, yes, really, no regrets, in it to win it. Uh, in it to win it, I can prove to you, uh, my six-year-old daughter has yet to beat me in a foot race and one of these days she will earn it. And she will be proud uh, of the competitive spirit that I give her one of these days. Now, thankfully, I've calmed down a little bit more over the last couple years. And I've got plenty of other embarrassing stories that I can share with you after service if you want. But I I wanted to set up uh, that there's two types of people when it comes to winning by by acknowledging that. Because I I, want to acknowledge that what we're talking about today is going to resonate with some of you more easily than, than others. But regardless of what type of person you consider yourself, whether you're an in it to win it or you're a take it or leave it's person, I I think one of the things that we could probably all agree on together is that winning is important, right? Winning is important. And if you're a take it or leave it's person, you're probably like, ah, Curtis, like, ah, I don't don't know. It kind of depends on what it is. I, I, I think then we could probably at least agree on this, that winning is better than not winning, Right? I can prove that to you here pretty quickly. Uh, How many of you, by round of applause, would like to be a Cleveland Browns fan? Yes, one. You, you, and me. Like we are, we're sad souls here. You're like, there's usually an audible groan when I tell people I I want to like the Cleveland Browns. We're just like, ugh. Why would you do that to yourself? You know, like why, why, why would you do that? And that's because, like, we know, like at the at the bottom, like we know at the core. Winning is, is better than not winning. Like if we were all given the choice, we would choose to win. And here's the deal. When it, when it comes to sports, right, when it comes to, to competitions, when it comes to the football field, like it's easy to tell. It's a, we know what it looks like when you're winning. But have you ever thought about what it looks like to win in regards like to your life? Right, right. What does it look like for you to win at life? And that's one of the, que- that's the questions, the core question we're asking today is what's the win? What is the win for you? Right? This can be a game-changing question for you and those closest in your circle of life. Have you ever asked yourself that question? What's the win? What's the win? And winning's important because winning is better than not winning. And given the choice, we would all choose to win, especially in the most important arena, your life. So what's the win? You're in a dating relationship right now? What's the win? What's the win in that relationship? Is it marriage? Right? Is it, is it a good, healthy marriage? Is, is, is the win kids? What's the win? Financially, man, money. We think about money all of the time. We work so hard to make money, try and save some, have some to spend some and enjoy it. But what's the win for you financially in your relationships? What's the win? Did you know that when someone mentions you in a conversation, right, when you come to mind, words come to mind. Did you know that? When you come to mind, words come to mind. Right, he's so, she's so, he's such a, you know, maybe you don't fill in that blank. Right, but when, when, when you come to mind, words come to mind. And wouldn't it be a win to determine beforehand what you want those words to be and then live your life in such a way that that's what comes to mind when you come to mind? What's the win for you professionally? 
I mean, if you don't determine the win professionally, and I'm, I'm really trying hard to learn this one myself, like leading a church. If you don't determine what the win is for you professionally, it can be like you running a race, and you're giving it everything that you got. And you get to the finish line, and you run right by the finish line, and you just keep going because you had no idea that you found your win. And meanwhile, you just keep running, and you're exhausted. But it's because you didn't realize I got to where I wanted to be. I, I won. You see, in, in the areas that matter most, most people never define their win. So you need to take time in order to determine what your win is, what you are fighting for, what you are in this, what you are in this and aiming for. And if you don't, define your win, what happens is you end up adopting someone else's. And so you date like everybody else dates. You spend money the way everybody else spends their money. You work the way everybody else works. You treat your spouse like everybody else treats their spouse. You, you, you parent the way that you were parented. Or you take your parenting cues from those around you and not pursuing your win, you settle for what a preacher named Adam Johnson calls not goals. I'm not going to be, we won't be, that won't be part of our story. I'm not going to, I'm just trying to be better than my parents. But what I want you to notice is like, although that may be good, not goals are not wins. They're not wins. And so this, this morning, what I want to do is we kind of jump into the text, is, is I want to show you a guy, a guy in the Bible that determined and defined his win, and then he reordered his life in such a way so that he could proceed with purpose, so that when he got to the finish line, he knew that he had made it. And so I want to jump in. And then he goes in and then he actually tells us how we can achieve our wins by doing what he does. And now here's my, here's, here's my caution for you this morning. If, if this is practical to us, whether you are a follower of Jesus, whether you're a Christian or, or, or not, uh, and I'm, gonna to, I'm going to show you what his win is, what this guy named Paul, what his win is, but my point in showing you what his win is is not that I think you should adopt his win. Right, whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, what I want to show you is how he decides his win and then he orders his life and he gives us some practical things that we could do so that we could win in the most important arenas of our life. And you get to decide what are the most important arenas of your life. If you're married, you've decided an arena. If you have kids, you have decided an arena. Right, professionally, you get to decide that arena. And so this guy named Paul, he writes a letter to a church in Corinth, the Greek city of Corinth. And in the middle of this letter, he kind of points out, he highlights what his win is and then gives us some practical things of what it looks like for us to pursue and achieve our wins. He writes this, 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 19, he says this, he says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. Why? Here's our phrase, to win as many as possible. And so what Paul says here, he says, though I am free, like I have made myself a slave to everyone. Now something you need to know about Paul is Paul at one point in time had decided the win in his life was to stamp out Christianity. He wanted to, and he was behind the arresting, the beating, and the execution, in some cases, of many followers of Jesus, right, of many Christians. He had decided that that was the win in his life, and he thought he was doing it for God. And then one day, while he was out pursuing this mission, he was confronted by the resurrected Jesus, and it was, uh-oh, I've been doing this wrong. Like, I've, I've had my win wrong. And so he reorders his life, and he changed his win to where at this point in time where Paul is writing his, this letter, if you said, Paul, what is your win? Paul's answer would be, my win is people. My, my, my win is people. I want to convince and show as many people as possible that God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son to come here and live and show us what it looks like to really love God. And, and then he died on the cross for our sins. And three days later, he came back from the dead, proving that we could trust him and that we could be forgiven and live life in a good relationship with God. That's my win. Paul says, my win is people. My win is, 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 is people and telling as many people as possible the story of what God did through Jesus. That's my win. And so he goes on and he writes in verse 20, he says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. And he says, to the Jews, I became like the Jew, to which we're like, Paul, you you don't become a Jew, you are a Jew. Well, Paul actually was a Jew. And so what what he's saying here is, man, when I was around my Jewish friends and my Jewish families, Like, I was the best rule-keeping, law-following Jew that one could possibly be. I did the best. Well, why, Paul? Why would you do that? And Well, my hopes is to win, to show them, to win some influence with them and show them that Jesus has been the, the guy that they've been looking for. And so he goes on, verse 21. So to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. Paul says, I can get along with anybody because I have a North Star. You see, for Paul here, where he says here, the law he's talking about is, see, in, in the Old Testament, the first part of our Bible, the pre-Jesus part of the story, the, the Jews, like they had uh, all these laws. It was over like 600 laws that they had to keep in order to be in good standing with God. And then Jesus comes and he, he shows us, man, I can sum up all of those commands in one command. And he hands it off to, to, to Jesus and his, his, Jesus hands it off to his closest followers and he says, okay, here's the deal. Here's what everything comes back to. You go love people the way that I, Jesus, have loved you. You go love and serve people the way that I have loved and served you. That's what Paul's saying. That's Christ's law. And so that's what I'm living out. I'm loving and serving people the way that Jesus loved and served me. This is why Paul gives up violence as a means to win people over to his cause. And he starts loving and serving and going around and telling people about Jesus. And he writes all these letters to the churches. And so he goes on in verse 22, he says this. So to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. And then I love, I love this part of the verse. He says, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I love that phrase, by all possible means, which means I've thought this through. I, I have organized my life. I have, I have ordered my life, my time, my resources in such a way that by all possible means, I might win some to Jesus. And so what comes next? That's his win. What comes next is for you, it's for me, it's for for whether you're a follower of of Jesus or or not. And and Paul, he seems as though he he like switches topics here because he he dips into this this sports metaphor, which is one of the reasons why I I love learning from Paul so much in, in the Bible. He dips into the sports metaphor in order to give us a sense of urgency about how important this is. Because he writes this in verse 24. He says, do you not know... Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, run, but only one gets the prize? To which we're like, well, Paul, wait a minute. In my generation, we all got a prize, you know, like the participation trophy, you know. Uh, But uh, this is with with, with Paul. Like, we know, like, yeah, Paul, like, we know this is really how it works. Do you not know that, Paul asks these essence, do you not know that all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? You see, in a competition, it's so easy to see what's going on, right? In a race, you're all lined up together, and you can tell how you're doing in comparison to the rest. Right? On a football field, you can always look up at the scoreboard, and you know the score. Even at, like, a competition, like cheerleading or, or, or dance, you know where you stand. Someone went before you. You're up next. Someone's going to go behind you. You always know where you're at, but... When it comes to your life, right, your marriage, your profession, your parenting, your friendships, it's it's difficult to tell, isn't it? It's It's just not as obvious. 
And because it's not as obvious, consequently what happens because of that is we lack urgency. And so Paul writes, like, do you not know that uh, in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. And he finishes verse 24. He says, run in such a way as to get the prize. He, he says, live your life with the same urgency, right? The same focus, the same order that it would take for you to win the prize. Essentially what he's saying here is, is pay the price you have to pay in order to win the prize. Pay the price you have to pay in order to win the prize. So, so as, as we're talking about like 2020 coming in, right, 2019 coming to a close, and this is the time of year where we start talking about New Year's resolutions and, and what things are going to look like going forward, uh, the question I, I want to ask you is, what's the price you've been refusing to pay? Right, you, you want to win in your relationships? Maybe, maybe it's time to finally pay the price and make it a focus for you to go to counseling, right, and deal with some of that baggage that you've been lugging around and, and finally, finally deal with some of that so you can get healthy and establish some boundaries and have good relationship. What's the win in, in, in your marriage? Right, for some of you, the, the price you've been refusing to pay is you, you need to get off Facebook or, or, or Snapchat or social media or you, you need to get out of that, that, that golf league or bowling league and, and really make it a focus to have some face-to-face -to -face time together. You need to quit watching that, those TV shows right, and make being with one another something. Maybe it is going to counseling. What's the win with your finances? What's the price you've been refusing to pay? You've been pushing off, forming that budget forever. Maybe it's starting with a budget that includes generosity. What's, what's the price that you've been refusing to pay in order to get your win? Right? Because in an athletic competition, there is always a price to pay. You know that. We know that. We know that when it comes to an athletic competition, but for some reason, we don't treat life that way. And so Paul goes on, and, and he writes in verse 25. He says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to, to win a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And so what's pretty cool here is Paul references the very first Olympic Games. And what they would do is they would go into strict training in order to, to win, you know, these Olympic Games. And the winner of the Olympic Games would get up there and, and they would get a crown of woven together leaves, of laurel leaves. It's actually where we get the phrase resting on your laurels from, like the idea of using your past achievements to now rest. You know, that's where we get the phrase resting, resting on, on your laurels. And so, so Paul is saying here, think about all the time and the effort and the money and the energy that goes into training for these games so that you can win a crown of leaves. That's going to look good for one, two, three days a week at most. And then they dry and they wither away. It's, but, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So he, now he starts talking to those of us who are Jesus followers, like in, in particular. And he says, we do it to get a crown that, that will last forever. Talking about spending eternity with, with, with God. And Paul's saying, because I don't want to get to the end of my life and wonder if I won, I don't want to get to the end of my life and wonder, how did I do? And so Paul, because, because he, he recognizes, man, the prize I'm competing for will last forever. Paul says this then. He says, therefore, because I realize what I'm competing for is so much bigger than just now. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer just beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Essentially, Paul is saying, man, I, I made some big changes. And so now I do not run like someone running aimlessly anymore. You know, if, if we're really honest with ourselves, right, it's so easy in our culture, right, to do relationships 
aimlessly, to, to, to spend our money, to parent, to work, to do anything that we have to do aimlessly. That's easy, but that doesn't help us win. And so if you have not defined a win in the important arenas of life, it is so, it's extremely easy for us to spend a season or seasons of our life running aimlessly. And Paul says, I am, I'm not doing that anymore. I do not fight like a boxer just beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave. Why, Paul? Because I know what I'm about. I have a North Star. I, I have defined the win for my life and I'm going to make sure that at the end of the day, I've gotten to where I want to be. Even though it means I'm going to have to say no to me for now. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you want? I, I know it is. Because look, I mean, just, just kind of look back at some of the big things that you have accomplished in your life. Those things didn't happen by accident. It happened because you defined the win, right? And you ordered and organized your life and you pursued that, right? So, so what's the win? Paul, he, 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 he's saying something to us that, that you already know, we already know, and that's you don't win by wishing, you don't win by, by talking. You don't win by hoping. You don't even win really by planning. You win by preparing to win. And so what's the win for you? What, what, what's the win for you relationally? What's the win for you financially, academically, professionally? What is it that you want people to say about you one of these days when you're gone, are you preparing to win? Singles, if the win for you is a happy, fulfilling marriage, then you cannot date the way most people date. Right? If a, if a happy, great, fulfilling marriage, then you, if you want a marriage that is not like most marriages, then you cannot date the way most daters date. My challenge to you would be, man, take a year off. I'm serious. Take a year off so that you can really find yourself, you can clarify yourself so that, so that when you step back into the game, you have a clarity. You have a, uh, have a clarity so that you will not date aimlessly. You have a purpose and goal in mind. Married couples, if the win for you is to be old and still enjoy being around each other, then you have to invest in each other now. You can't say we'll figure it out once the kids don't have practice anymore. You've gotta find time and make time with each other a priority now. It can't be once I get the perfect job or that promotion or I grow my business to where I want it to be. It needs to be now. And at the, at the risk of being just a little bit dramatic, all right, and it, it, may be, it may be a little dramatic. You may say it's a little dramatic, but I, I think that might be just shifting responsibility to make it sit a little bit easier. At the risk of being a, a little dramatic, you only get one season. You only get to be in your 20s one time, right? You can't go back next fall and redo your 20s again. You only get to be in your 30s one time. You only get one first marriage. You only get one first job. You only get to raise each of those kids one time. The clock is ticking. And you have to decide what is going to get your focus and the win in those arenas. And I want you to remember this. When you win in the most important arenas of, in life, those around you win as well. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I, I hope that some of the things that we've talked about as we've gone through this this morning, I hope that it will be helpful. I hope it will be inspiring. I hope that you will go out of here this morning going into 2020 and you will set uh, up some big goals, some wins. This isn't just a Christian thing, right? This is, this is a life thing. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, I, I want you to know 
I think Jesus is the key to the most important win in your life. As I live out Jesus' teachings in my life, I am becoming a better husband, a better father, a better man, a better worker, right? He's coming through in every arena of life. And so if Jesus is correct, and I believe that he is, our lives are not bookended with a birth certificate and a death certificate. There is more to it than that. And without him, you are missing the most important win. And if you're willing to live out his wisdom in every other arena of life, why not live out his wisdom when it comes to spiritually, when it comes to spirituality as well? I want you to mark off on your connect card about baptism. And we're going to celebrate uh, one of our students named Sadie, who today is making Jesus the leader of her life when she's baptized here later in the service. But, but if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus like me, you want to live out Jesus' teachings in your life. That's, that's being a Christian. We're not going to be perfect at it, but we're going to do our best. And what we've talked about this morning, it's not just meant to be inspiring. Really, it's not optional. One of the wins for us is telling other people about Jesus. And so as I, I close out this morning, I, I want to share with you three of my personal wins that my wife and I have kind of worked out together. I want to share them with you. Uh, maybe they help inspire some of yours, and then we'll go home and watch the Ravens kick the crap out of the Steelers. Does that sound good? Hopefully they'll all keep their helmets on, you know. Um, my first win is this. Uh, when I die, I, I hope that someone at my funeral, I hope the first thing that's said about me at my funeral has something to do with Jesus. I hope they say that, 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 that I lived out Jesus well. I hope they say that people knew Jesus, were now followers of Jesus because of how I lived my life. And you know what that helped me realize really quickly? Is that means I need to talk about Jesus more. And not just on Sunday morning, right? Yeah, sure, like that's, that happens. Uh, but in my personal life, at the gym, the guys I play softball with, at the bar, you know, like I, I got to talk about Jesus more. My second win is that I hope they will say that I love my wife, Abby, well. The way Jesus would say it in the Bible is that, that, that I loved her the way that Jesus loved the church. And my third win is kind of a two-parter. Uh, I hope that we'll be able to say that uh, we raised kids who love and follow Jesus and love being around each other, love getting to hang out together as a family. Those are lofty wins, right? And what I'm, what I'm learning uh, as I'm learning my wins, it's helping me to order my life around that. And I know that I need help. And that's why my wife and I, we've started to pray this prayer together. God, give us good, godly friends. And we've started to pray for our kids. God, surround our kids with good, godly friends. This is why it's so important that you make being a collective on Sunday morning a priority. Because you've got to have good, godly people in your life. Right, we're, that's new series. Thank God it's Monday. It's starting next week, and it's helping begin to pursue these wins and how God's wisdom will help us find those things. You need to get in a collective, groups of people that meet together during the week to talk about what we talk about on Sunday morning. Because here's what I've learned: right, good people, good people are a dime a dozen, but godly people is what will make the difference in your life. You've got to find a way to surround yourself with good, godly people so that you can get your wins. I want to say to you what Paul is saying to us. Don't run like someone running aimlessly anymore. Let your life, your money, your parenting, your dating, your work live in such a way. Live in such a way. The way Jesus, I think, would say it is this. Let your light shine in such a way that people catch a glimpse of your Father in heaven through you. That's a win. And that kind of living changed the world once. But in the meantime, for you, for me, for all of us, what is the win? Because after all, winning is better than not winning. Let me pray for you, and we'll get into the next part of our service. God, we love you. God, thank you so much for, for loving us. God, thank you for Paul. God, thank you that he loved sports and was not afraid to use sports to help teach us about Jesus. God, I, I pray that you give us wisdom to help us uh, define what, what, what our wins need to be in our life. God, that they, those wins would honor you. 
Uh, God, that then you would give us courage and, and the guts to do what needs to be done in order to pursue those wins. God, God, we love you and we thank you so much for Jesus. It's in your son's holy and awesome name we pray. Amen.